rise. So God gave me a word I want to share with you, that word, John chapter 5. Go to John chapter 5. Let me share with you. And by the way, this, I can't, pastor, thank you for your prophetic courage, and I'll leave it at that. Your prophetic courage, it's, it's shifting the conversation in a redemptive, reconciliatory manner. The spirit of love and truth and grace, how you delivered those appropriate words. It, it's a tool of God to heal a nation. And the push, the, the feedback has been amazing. And I mean amazing of going like, yeah, that was just God. So we know God touched it and it will, it will continue to serve as a balm of Gilead, a tourniquet for a nation that is bleeding right now. So thank you for your prophetic courage. John chapter 5, and we're going to read this. Before I read this, I look around. This is the mosaic, the tapestry of God's kingdom. You look like heaven. It looks like heaven. And the way you were praising before, I'll leave you with this nugget before I begin. The way you were praising, it's a bit outside the normative of what you would see in a common church in America in the 21st century. You are a bit expressive. I, rumors have it. I don't know if you know, but you're loud. And Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. And you're not the normal cup of tea. But if anyone ever critiques you for being a bit vociferous in respect to your praise and worship expression, I want you to respond to them. And don't go too deep into the theology because it's biblically substantiated. But simply stated, just tell them, there's a reason why I praise the way I praise. And, and then you can continue by telling them, it's a math equation. And if they ask you what does that mean, tell them the size of my praise is directly proportional to the magnitude of the hell that God took me out of. I'll say that one more time. The size of your praise is directly proportional to the magnitude of the hell that God took you out of. If God took you out of a little hell, then you give him a little praise. But if he saved you, if he delivered you, if he healed you, if he turned you around and placed your feet on solid ground, then you give God the highest. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. John chapter 5. I'm going to read this quickly. Rise, rise, rise. Ayúdanos, Padre, en el nombre de Jesús. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda. With five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porch. Hence the illustration. He's not a random stalker who just laid down for the heck of it. He's here for a purpose. Lay on the porch waiting for a certain movement of the water. Verse 4, included in some narratives, but it's, here it is. For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step into the water would be healed of whatever disease he or she had. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. It's never my turn. So Jesus told them, rise up. Pick up your mat and start walking. Instantly, the man who was healed, he rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But here comes the, the clincher here. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So I want to speak to you under the collective canopy of rise. But it happened on the Sabbath when God makes it happen when it's not supposed to happen. So I want you to, the subtitle of that would be I'm next. I want you to touch your neighbor, the one you do like, and tell him I'm next. Tell your other neighbor, the one you barely tolerate. And tell that neighbor, I'm next. Tell your neighbor a couple of rows away from you, point to them and tell them, you're next. Tell somebody five rows down, tell them, you're next. Tell somebody seven rows down, tell them, you're next. I 
I dare you to prophesy to them and tell them you're next. Your family is next. Your home is next. You're next. You're next. You're next. You're next. You are next. Rise, rise, rise. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be. But it happened on the Sabbath. It happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. I'm next. Rise up. Take up your mat. Start walking. The picture has been painted via the conduit of this beautiful narrative. We have a pool, the pool of Bethesda. We have the broken, the paralyzed, sick folk. And we have this occasional visitation from heaven. There was already a construct in place where heaven would come down and visit and stir up the waters. On occasion, it was periodical. The Greek word in its appropriate exegete would infer to us without any shadow of a doubt that there was no definitive time when heaven would come down and visit the waters. It wasn't like on a set date. It would happen on occasion with no, let's just say, advance notice. So on occasion, an angel would come down, heaven would come down, stir up the waters, whoever would step in would receive their corresponding miracle healing or breakthrough. That's the reality. Around the pool of Bethesda, we have the lame and the paralyzed folk. Paralyzed, paralyzed, paralyzed. This man for 38 years, paralyzed, over a generational span, and, and he always missed his turn. His words, not mine. He explicitly reveals the reason in verse number seven. No one is there to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Your breakthrough is directly proportional to your dependency. He depended on others for his breakthrough. He depended on others for his healing and for his miracle. When you depend on others more than you depend on God, you will never see the fullness of what God purposed for you. Let me reiterate. When you depend on others more than you depend on God, you will never see the fullness of what God has purpose for your life. When you depend on others more than you depend on God, perpetual paralysis will define you. It's a matter of dependency. And we live in an age where we are in a modus operandi of perpetual dependency. We depend on others to make us happy, to make us complete. We depend on others for our breakthroughs. We depend on government, media, and culture to teach our children what is right and wrong. Modesto, it's time for a shift. I said it's time for a shift. I said it's time for a shift. Your destiny cannot be in someone else's hand. Your future cannot be in someone else's hand. Your family cannot be in someone else's hand. God forbid that our children could be in the hands of culture, media, politicians, or society. From this moment on, your future, your family, and your destiny are in the hands of the one who said in John 10, 28, nothing will be able to snatch them away from my hand. Tell your neighbor, tell him, I depend on God alone. Psalm 62, verse 5. Tell your other neighbor, I depend on God alone. And, and, and he, Jesus shows up 38 years, and this man was dependent on others, and Jesus shows up. And, and number one, if you're taking any notes, an, uh, an authentic encounter with Jesus will always end generational paralysis. An authentic, not a religious, an authentic encounter with the living God, with Jesus, will end generational paralysis. And he was paralyzed. And by the way, before you judge, we have all been paralyzed here. Not necessarily physically, but spiritually, emotionally, financially, relationally, we have all been paralyzed. We have all been through a moment in time where there was a lack of mobility, a lack of action. We have all been paralyzed, paralyzed integrity, faith, dreams, paralyzed destiny, paralyzed family members, ministries, paralyzed harvest, paralyzed by what? Paralyzed by sin. Sin paralyzes. Failure, fear, the past, shame, religious condemnation, self-pity, a victimization mentality, poverty, erroneous thoughts, abuse, broken relationships, unforgiveness and unbelief, we have all been paralyzed. Some of us have been paralyzed by others' opinions of us. So if someone says something, it paralyzes us. 
if they post something. We're paralyzed by Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. We're paralyzed. And some of us are paralyzed by this need of constant validation or affirmation. Like, 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 like. Listen, folks, we're not the fun. We are not defined by the likes of many. We are defined by the love of one. <laughs> Paralyzed by fear. The fear of windows, of what we see in the outside world, and the fear of mirrors, of what we see within ourselves. We've all been paralyzed at the corporate macro level. Just like this man, we turn on the news, we stand privy to the fact that there is a generation in America and around the world for that matter, paralyzed by moral relativism, cultural decadence, spiritual apathy, by violence and corruption, darkness, hatred, bigotry, intolerance, perversion, and death. Paralyzed by political correctness. Paralyzed by political discord. Turn on Fox, MSNBC, CNBC, CBS, ABC, NBC, and even Univision. Que viva Univision para siempre, canalito, hombre. And you will see that this nation is paralyzed. We are paralyzed. I'm going to reiterate. I'm going to give a list that I shared at General Counsel. We are paralyzed, and we need to understand, man. There's a rubric out there. We're paralyzed because we tolerated things. We've paralyzed because we've been complacent. There's a list I gave at GC. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Today's complacency is to, number two, you are what you tolerate. There are things that you have the power to rebuke that you have tolerated. Number three, there is no such animal as comfortable Christianity. There isn't. Number four, truth must never be sacrificed on the altar of political, cultural, or sexual expediency. And number five, we need to reconcile our eschatology with our missiology, which means what? I know Jesus is coming, and I know he's coming, and I believe he's coming, and I know he's coming. Well, I believe that. But while we're waiting for Jesus to come down, Jesus is waiting for us to stand up. <laughs> Paralyzed. Turn on the news. Even in the past few weeks, we have a nation that stands paralyzed, literally. And the answer to the question is, how do we end this paralysis? What we don't need are more, respectfully, are we live streaming? Great. What we need, what we don't need, here it is, here we are, get hate mail. What we don't need are more followers of the donkey or more followers of the elephant. What we need is America. What we need in America is more followers of the lamb, Jesus. I'm gonna get somebody upset. We don't need more Democrats. We don't need more Republicans. We need more devil rebuking, demon binding, blood washed, Holy Ghost filled, prophetic, holy healed, healthy, happy, humble people that lift up the name of Jesus. Are there any Jesus freaks in this house tonight? The answer to America's paralysis is Jesus. It's the church of Jesus. Not just any church, by the way, but a united church. I said a united church. Because a divided church will never heal a broken nation. Oh, la sangre de Cristo, Padre. Yo, oh, boy, get people upset. The answer to America's paralysis is the holy church. 1 Peter 1.16, a healed church. 1 Peter 2.24, a healthy church. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, a joyful church. John 15.11, yes, because we're not the bad news people or the sad news people. We are the good news people. So don't drink the Kool-Aid, man. I said don't drink the Kool-Aid. Everyone's talking about doomsday, eclipse, everything going to hell in a handbasket. This thing is going from worse to worse and it's going to hit rock bottom. And no, someone recently stated, it doesn't matter what the church preaches or what the church does. Things are not going to change. The church is irrelevant. This message is irrelevant. Don't drink. That's what the devil would love you to believe. Listen, I need you to understand. Put a smile on your face and a praise on your lip because there's an awakening about to hit this nation like we've never seen before. I'm here to tell you it'll make a Susan look like an appetizer man there's a move of God a 
about to hit this nation like we've never seen before. Our children will not go to hell. Our children will not be lost. We are about to see God show up. Put a smile on your face and just, I'm gonna put a smile on your face right now. Do it. Put a smile. Just a smile. The big, I don't care if you ate something, those tacos in Modesto that are famous. <laughs> Even if you have that little bit of carne asada taco right there, whatever it is. Put a smile on your face. Look at your neighbor with that food vestige in your mouth. Look at your neighbor right now and smile and ask your neighbor, why are you smiling? <laughs> yes. Go ahead, ask him, why are you smiling? And I want you to respond to that neighbor. Tell him, because of the power of still. Go ahead, ask him what still? Tell him God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. Hey, Made hey, CNN, hey, Fox, hey, MSNBC, hey, ABC, hey, Wall Street Journal, hey, New York Times, hey, San God is still on the We gotta hurry, we gotta hurry, we gotta hurry. Are there any questions? Okay. All right. Because no. they were powerful. I'm just speaking about paralysis and the, the presence of Jesus ends generational paralysis. He really, really does. And then. Santo Dios. Yes. And he. The presence of God. Number two, the presence of God always makes you next. What does that mean? He, I'm just reading the narrative. He, this man said, someone always gets there ahead of me. I always miss my turn. When God shows up, he makes you next, even if you missed your turn before. I'm about to preach to people who have missed their turn somewhere in the past. Now, how many can look back in time and acknowledge the fact that at one moment or another, you missed your turn? If you have missed at least one, you know what I'm talking about. You missed that turn in your life. Or is it about the night? It's not about Route 99, saints. I'm talking about the turns of life. If you've missed your turn in life at least one time, raise one hand. You know... If you've missed your turn at least two times in your life, raise both hands. If you missed them, missed them so many you lost count, raise both hands and a foot. If you never want to miss a turn again, raise both hands and both feet. So I'm going to give you the word that God gave me. If you've been waiting for your turn, if you've been praying for your turn, if you've been fasting for your turn, if you've been through hell for your turn, if you have fought off devils, demons, principalities, and powers of darkness, if you fought off people and even yourself for your turn, I'm here to tell you in the name of Jesus, you are about to be the next person to see the fullness of what God has promised you. You will be next. So I'm here to tell you in the name of Jesus, not, not, not only because of what you've been through, but because of where you're going to. Ooh, not out of the womb of emotional exuberance. I'm committed to the centrality of Christ and to biblical truth, biblical orthodoxy. Isaiah 1427, what God has planned for you cannot and will not be stopped. I'm here to tell you right now, I know it sounds crazy, but you're next. And I know it sounds, oh, that's prophetic hyperbole. No, that's the word of God. I, I am believing that you're next. Everything you've been through is because you're next. The devil's not attacking you because of the foolish things you did in your past. He's attacking you because of the glorious things you're about to see in your future. I'm preaching to somebody right here. All the hell that has risen against you has nothing to do with where you were. It has everything to do with where you are going now in this season. I need you to high five your neighbor. Tell him I'm next. Tell him I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. I am next to see my family saved. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I am next. I am next to see my entire family saved. 
I am next to reap an unprecedented harvest. I am next to partake of an awakening in my nation. I am next to witness a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I am next for the breakthrough. I am next for the overflow. I am next for the healing. If you believe that, praise like your next, dance like your next, rejoice like your next, worship like your next, make a joyful noise like you are. Your next. You don't get it. Porque no están entendiendo esto. La razón por la cual han pasado por lo que han pasado. The reason you've been through what you've been through has nothing to do with the past. It's about this hour. You're not alive by coincidence. God's about to do something with you, in you and through you. No, you're not hearing me right now. There's purpose for your life. Not only Jeremiah 29, 11, but 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Your eye has yet to see. Your ear has yet to hear. Your mind has yet to imagine the wonderful things God has in store for you because you love him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. He who called you is faithful to do it. Philippians 1, 6. He who started a good work will finish the work he has started. You're next. No, you really are next. You're next to see the fullness of his glory, the fulfillment of his promise. You are next because you're, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you prophetically. Again, I fear the Lord. I fear the Holy Spirit. I don't want to say that out of emotionalism or, or to entice you for emotional response. I'm here to tell you in the name of Jesus, you're next. You, you, because this is the last day you will be paralyzed for the rest of your life. I'm preaching to at least seven people in this house right now. This is the last day. Your family will be paralyzed. Your home will be paralyzed. Your marriage will be paralyzed. Your integrity will be paralyzed. Your holiness will be paralyzed. Your dream will be paralyzed. Your praise will be paralyzed. Your destiny will be paralyzed. You will never be paralyzed again. So, here's what we're going to do. Because when I count to three, Pastor John, I want you to get up. And this is going to be illustrative of the fact that paralysis is over. And I, that's not like, oh, it's cute, it's an illustrated sermon. No, because we've been waiting. And some of you have seen other people get their miracle and their breakthrough. And you've been on the edge of it so close. You were at the precipice of something awesome and you saw someone else because there was no one there because of your uber dependency on others because you did not have the strength, the fortitude to push yourself in because you were paralyzed by fear and brokenness and shame and sin in the past and condemnation and religious constructs and ideology that impeded you from still, you were paralyzed by external wounds and by self-inflicted wounds. You were paralyzed and God told me to, and I say that with fear and trembling because there's a fine line between the prophetic and the pathetic. And God told me to tell you this is the day your paralysis ends once and for all. So I'm speaking to any, I sense such an anointing. Some of you shouldn't even be here right now. The fact that you're here means that God still has purpose for your life. No, I'm going to say that one more time. Some of you shouldn't even be here right now. According to the devil's plans, some of you should be in jail right now. Some of you should be getting stoned right now. Some of you should be in a mental asylum right now. Some of you should be six feet under right now. But guess what? Guess what? It's August 2017. You're not in jail. You're not in a hospital room. You're not six feet under. You are in God's house. You are in the house, Modesto, lifting up the name of. You're here. You're here. You're here because God, God has. By the way, you know why you made it? You know why you're still here? You're here not because you perfectly held on to God. You're here because God perfectly held on to you.
You're here not because your faith is so efficient. You're here because his grace is always sufficient. You're here because your destiny is not based on what's in front of you. Your destiny is based on who's inside of you. All right, are you ready to do this? When I say now, you're going you're gonna to get up. The moment you get up, the app. The moment you rise up, Every single person who has been paralyzed, your family, your home, your marriage, your ministry, your relationships, your integrity, your righteousness, your destiny, your dream, your future, your praise, your worship, your prayer life, your pursuit of righteousness, your love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, goodness, gentleness, temperance, mercy, faith, your calling and the giftings of God in your life that have been paralyzed. Whatever was paralyzed, every vestige, not some of it, every vestige of paralysis is about to end forevermore. You, if this is for you, and I, this is, it doesn't have to be for you, it could be for your neighbor, but if this is for you, I need you to look at somebody and tell them, that's all me, man. And, and if it's not for you, tell them, that's all you then. <laughs> all right, all right. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are, if, 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 oh, oh, by the way, he... He, he looks at him and, and, and says, do you, want, do you want to get well? What a question. Do you want to get well? The guy's paralyzed for 38 years, right? And this is one of the silliest responses ever recorded in Scripture. I can't. I never asked you if you could. If you could, I wouldn't be asking you. I didn't ask you if you could get. I asked you if you want what I have for you. It's not a, that's, you're so full of yourself. You're a narcissist. You're, you're a selfie person. It's all about you. This is not about you. Do you want what I have for you? It's yes or no, man. His thinking was paralyzed. His thoughts were paralyzed. Oh. I don't want to get deep rooted here and I won't we're going to end this right now we're going to, Jesus told him to stand up it wasn't demons coming down and stirring up the waters it was an angel a heavenly construct already in place y'all didn't hear that Jesus could have said aha every once in a while the angels work for me hey paralyzed man I'm going to tell you what do the angels work for me I have direct I have their, I could text them right now <laughs> and they will come because they work for me and I could make them stir this up and I'll, I'll, I'll carry you in sunshine and make this happen because I'm Jesus. So Jesus, even, even though Jesus, and that's a Southern Jesus, and that's, so it's not like there was already a paradigm, a model, a construct. Jesus did not subjugate himself to a construct that was heavenly ordained, but it, it was limited only to a few, help me Lord, because that construct only had access it only granted access to those that were right there at the precipice at the right time which means it wasn't for everyone it's like the law and grace there was already a construct in place but it was limited it had its limitations so Jesus shows up and says the waters bubble up and you get healed I'm gonna override the process bypass the bureaucracy I'm not putting you in the water I'm not stirring up the water I'm not here to change the circumstances around you I'm here to change you in the middle of your circumstances I'm I'm here to change you in the face of what you're facing. All right, let's do it. At the count of three, at the count of three, Pastor Joe, I want you to stand up. And it's not just another phrase, another request, because the presence of Jesus, an authentic encounter with the presence of Jesus permits you to rise up. In other words, to do what you could not do before. Jesus looks at him and says, stand up. Do what you could not do before. So I'm going to prophesy to someone here. Here it is. <laughs> When I count to three, he's going to stand up. And never again will your dream, family, faith, all of that, it won't be paralyzed. But I want you to hear this. You are about to do what you could not do before. And you are about to see what you could not see before. And you are about to conquer what you could not conquer before. And you are about to occupy what you could not occupy before. I want you to touch your neighbor, the one you like, and tell him paralysis will end right here, right now. 
Ask your neighbor, neighbor, are you ready to do what you could not do before? Are you ready to occupy what you could not occupy before? Are you ready to conquer what you could not conquer before? Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 1 says, rise up and I will speak to you. Acts 2 14 says, and Peter rose, he stood up and God spoke through him. Ah, here we go. At the count of three, every vestige of paralysis will come to an end. Oh, Bastan, that's, fu- oh no, just watch. By the time you get home, No, no, no. By the time you get home, whatever was paralyzed in your home, whatever. Whatever was paralyzed in your home will not be paralyzed. The power of Jesus will show up. Are you ready? All right, all right, all right. Your faith will never be paralyzed again. Your family will not be paralyzed. Your favor will not be paralyzed again. Your children and your children's children will never be paralyzed again. What? Get ready. Get ready to rock. I was going to say stand with me, but you are. You've been. Well, if you're already standing, I mean, I guess when I say three, just yeah, that looks awkward. You, You know what I mean? Yes, yes. So you think it's only an illustration. It shifts the atmosphere of a city, of a nation, of a generation. Your thinking will no longer be paralyzed. Watch, 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 watch. Woo-hoo. Rise up, ready? One, tell your neighbor, give me some room. Tell him it's my turn now. Tell him I've been praying for this moment. I've been fasting for this moment. I have battle scars for this moment. I've been praising for this moment. I've been through hell for this moment. I'm about to occupy what I could not occupy before. One, two, three, rise up. 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 Rise up! 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 All right. Let me hand it to the pastor here and raise your right hand. Repeat after me. My faith. My family, my my favor, my my future future will never be paralyzed again. again. Acts 17, 28, in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. In Christ, you will never be paralyzed again. In Christ, you will never be paralyzed again. I'll say that one more time. In Christ, you will never be paralyzed again. I said, in Christ, you will never be paralyzed again. In Christ, you will never be paralyzed again. We're done. Everybody, you are standing. Stand with me. Paralysis is over, man. And this is not the... So, he looks at him and says... You say, you're not going to be paralyzed ever again. But he looks at him and says, and as a church, we're not going to be paralyzed again. And as, like the big ecclesia, the, the, the American church, we're not going to be paralyzed again. We're not, we're not, we're good, we're not, we're not, because there is no such thing as silent Christianity. And there is no such thing as Christianity on mute. There isn't. And if somebody says, you know, why are you so, we're not weird, man, we're wired. That's what we are, we're wired. We're just wired. We're passionate. 
looks at him and says, stand up. So he looked at him and said, do what you could not do before. And in Christ, you could do what you could not do before. You, you could, because you're baptized with Christ unto death in Romans 6, 3. You're, you're crucified with Christ in Galatians 2, 20. You're seated with Christ in Ephesians 2, 6. You're hidden in Christ in Colossians 3, 3. And when it comes to Revelation, guess who's ruling with Jesus Christ forevermore? So he looks at him and says, rise up, pick up your mat. And I, I'm going to tell you why he had to pick up his mat. This is prophetic for someone. Because if he, if he would have left that mat behind, there would be an expectancy that he would one day go back to that place. Y'all didn't get that. You have to pick up your mat to tell the world. You want to tell every demon, devil, legion, principality of power. You even want to tell yourself, I don't live there anymore. I don't live there. Pick up your mat. Tell your neighbor, pick up your man, pick up your man, pick up your man. I don't live there anymore. I don't live there anymore. Tell your neighbor, I don't live there anymore. No, 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 stop for that. Say, tell your neighbor, I don't live there anymore. No, 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 Second Corinthians 5, 17. Come on, tell your neighbor, I don't live there anymore. I don't live in those thoughts anymore. I don't live in that bondage anymore. I don't live in that pit anymore. I don't live in that language anymore. I don't live in that habit anymore. I don't live in that destructive relationship anymore. I don't live there anymore. I don't live there anymore. De modo que si alguno está en Cristo, nueva criatura es. Las cosas viejas pasaron. En aquí todas son hechas nuevas. We are new creation in Christ Jesus. All right. All right, all right. Lift up your hands. We're done. For real, we're done now. I'm not, I'm not joking. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. New life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He told them, pick up your mat. And he told them, walk. Walk, walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7. Walk in the spirit and in the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. You walk, now I, you rise up, not just to rise up and go like, I, I'm up. No. You rise up to bring closure by picking up your man. And by walking, pursuing righteousness. By changing the world. God has awesome purpose for you. And I do mean that. His purpose is so amazing. It's Ephesians 3.20. It's exceedingly abundantly above all anything and everything you could imagine or ask for. It's beyond you. It's so great. What God has for you is mucho grande. I'm done. I'm going to give it to the pastor. Watch this. Watch what. Can I show you something? He told them to walk. It's not complicated, right? It's walk. 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 So, you walk. In a second, you're going to just right there where you're at he's going to take a step to show you're walking you're not where you used to be but I need you to this have you ever gone to the mall if you have been raise your hand if husbands if your wife have been there way more too often than what you ever expected when you got married raise both I'm kidding about that but if you've ever been to the mall, how many times have you ever, ever put your hand on the doorknob of a mall? You don't. Because the malls have doors. The doors have sensors. Whenever you approach the sensor, the doors do what? I can't, the doors do what? So by the way, you don't have to pry it open. You don't have to say, I'm here. You don't even have to raise your voice. You don't have to kick it open. You don't have to get help to open it up. All you have to do is show up. And the doors open up in your favor. And by the way, the doors open up in your favor suddenly. So every Pentecostal preacher has preached about the suddenlies, right? And it's good, it's cute, it's beautiful, God blesses it. But in truth be told, because to God one day is a thousand years, a thousand years like one day. And it's not really that it happens suddenly where God is surprised by it. It's really that you reach a place in your walk in Christ. That the doors that were waiting for you and open up suddenly because you reach a I'm preaching to somebody. Because you reach a certain place. I'm here to tell you that as you walk in the spirit, as you pursue right righteousness there are doors that are about to open up in your favor there are doors
doors that are about to open up in your favor suddenly. Oh. That door. So start walking. Start walking. So start walking. Pursue righteousness. Walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Walk by faith and not by sight. Walk. Just get up and just walk. I don't care what you've been through. Walk. I don't care what you're... Walk. And it's going to open up. You're reaching the place where you just walk. Touch your neighbor. Tell him walk. Tell your other neighbor. Tell him walk. Tell the neighbor that's the other neighbor of the neighbor. Tell him walk. Tell him start walking. Tell him start walking. There's a door with your name on it that's about to open up. Start walking. There are doors opening up in your favor. Start walking. There's dreams about. Start walking. Walk, 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 walk by faith. Walk in the spirit. Walk. Walk, walk. And I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. All right. All right. All right. I'm done. So with this, if this word is for you, if it's 179.3% for you, if it isn't for you, we're cool. But if it is for you, if you say, uh, that's all me. As a matter of fact, if you say, that's all me. <laughs> but, and I'm giving it to pastor, it happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. Now, that's the part. No, no, no. It says, but. But, read it. And in the, in the Greek exegetist, it's, it's still but. Meaning, I grew up where, but. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But is the... But is the quintessential grammatical interrupter. Everything's fine, but it happened. A disruptor, a grammatical disruptor. There's a glitch in the proverbial matrix. But it happened. The man stood up. He's walking. The religious class see him. And we're from California, so I'm going to speak parenthetically with nomenclatures germane to our region of the nation. Dude. Dude, what are you carrying? The man was paralyzed for 30 years. You would suspect. They would go, dude, you're walking. Dude, you're walking. And they went, dude, you can't carry that today. Because religious people always get upset when God uses people they deem unqualified. Haters gonna hate. Haters gonna hate. Haters gonna hate. Haters gonna hate. But here's the way I look at that. If their praise didn't make you, their criticism cannot break you. He says, it's the Sabbath. Here's for somebody. This means, Isaiah 60, 22 says, when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. It means that God will do it when people say he's not supposed to do it. God will do it when hell says he's not supposed to do it. God will do it when your flesh says he's not supposed to do it. God will do it when your circumstances say he's not supposed to do it. How about this? God will do it when your past says he's not supposed to do it. He'll do it on the Sabbath. He'll do it in the midst of a storm. He'll do it in a fiery furnace. He's so powerful like he did with Lazarus. He'll do it even after it's been declared dead. Because my God is not limited by the Sabbath. Let me prophesy to somebody. What God is going to do next in your life will anger hell. Upset the Pharisees and give you a testimony that will change your life forevermore. If you believe that, say amen. Yeah. Are there any questions? 
It happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. This past December, I received a call, an interesting call. I'm not going to get into the minutia of the politics because politics is not germane. I'm not a donkey or elephant guy. I'm a lamb's agenda guy. So it's not a marry a political ideology. I don't drink the political Kool-Aid. Nevertheless, I have values that are Christ-centered and Bible-based that I will never sacrifice for a politician or for a political ideology, ever. <laughs> Nevertheless, I got a call this past December. I, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, I, was, I served the Bush White House, George W., and then President Obama, who I disagreed with on 92% of his policies, but I respected him, and I prayed for him. And, and here's the word I'm going to use that's politically incorrect. You're going to say, how dare you say that? I love the man. And I disagreed with him. And, but why couldn't you love him? I love this president. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. Because that's what we're called to do. We're Christians. We're not called to hate. We're called to love. Even with the people we disagree, we must love. Even in a world full of hate, we're called to love. That message brought to you, but I do love them.com. Now, that's it besides the point. True story, you already know, December I got a call after the election. My wife was in the car. Um, Reverend Rodriguez, we're calling you from the inaugural committee, the president's transition team. The president would like you to participate in the swearing-in ceremony. It's, it would be the first Latino evangelical in American history, the first Pentecostal in American history to participate. The first assembly of God, the first person addicted to caramel macchiato. A lot of firsts would be in that list. I've been set free from that, by the way. I'm six months clean. Chai lattes are my thing now. That's besides the point. Make sure it's soy milk. Now you begin lactose intolerance. Different story. Different story for another day, God forbid. But here it is. I get a call. My wife is right in the car. The, the president would like you to participate in the swearing-in ceremony. I go, wow. Okay, look, I, I go, let, let me, I am so honored to tell the, pres the president-elect that I'm, I'm, I'm honored. I was in my car. When we cut back from San Francisco, when that happened, honey, weren't we in San Francisco coming back? Coming back, we were eating at that Puerto Rican restaurant, I think, in San Rafael. Good food, by the way. You got to eat it. Great stuff. But anyway, besides the point, just don't, just don't distract me right now. So we were, <coughs> I get the call. And, and so I said, let me speak to my executive committee. My executive committee is my wife and my three kids. <laughs> My wife looked at me and said, there's nothing to talk about. When I, was in, when I was 14 years old in the Assembly of God Church in Pennsylvania, I'm from Bethel, Pennsylvania. That's my native place. I'm from Pennsylvania. She said, a guy came in from Teen Challenge and prophesied to you and said, you're going to pray over presidents. That's why in the darkest moments of my life when I found myself like the paralyzed man next to the miracle but paralyzed by fear and paralyzed by so many things, I had no choice but to rise. I had no option because God looked at me and said, do you want what I have for you? So we, three weeks later, right before Christmas, they called back and said, Rodriguez, have you made up your mind? And I went, okay, I have one question for you. Are you going to tell me what to pray or what to read? Because I know in other things in other administrations and I don't blame them they give you what to read and what to what to pray believe it or not because they don't want anybody to mess things up or say crazy things so they they, they you basically are a spokesperson for their narrative so I respect that I have no issues that I, are you gonna tell me the person said this quote unquote ho ho stop no 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 we want you to share and we won't censor it whatever the spirit tells you to share <laughs> So this past January, you saw just, you saw this guy who lived this story. But it happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. You're not getting that. I happen to be of Latino ancestry. My last name is not Rogers or Jones or Smith. It's Rodriguez Carnalito. Orale, Holmes. I'm not going to get into what happened in the campaign or what accusations there were. Let's just say for him to feature, for this to feature a Latino on the pulpit 
Somebody said, this is not supposed to happen. I went, I know, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it? People told me to bail out, jump ship, don't do it, get away from there, no way, huh? And I just said, devil, you a liar. I was born for this hour. I was anointed for this hour. I got on the microphone, 1.1 billion people around the world were watching, and I did the prayer and the declaration from Matthew chapter 5, almost read the entire chapter. Nothing was censored, not one word was taken away. And when I finished, I, had, I was the first one after the cardinal who finished in his respectful way, but not the way that I finished, and God bless him. I had to finish the way God told me to finish. And I looked, I looked at the camera, presidents were all there, and I, these, what, these men who have served our country, I've disagreed with, but I honor and respect the office indeed. And behind me was President Clinton and President Obama and President Bush and then the President-elect Trump. They had the Supreme Court Congress. And I looked at the cameras and I, I looked at the cameras and I finished and I said, respectfully, in the name of Jesus Christ. And someone said, you just did that to tick off people that, no, no, I didn't. God forbid I wouldn't do that. Do you know why I said that? Because I am a spirit and power person. Okay. Which means, I don't care if I use old school terms, I am a Pentecostal. What does that mean? It means that I believe that when I mention that name, every devil, demon, legion, principality, and power of darkness has to flee. I believe there is still power in the name of Jesus. If this is for you, at the count of three, if this is for you, just, we're just going to pray. I'm going to drop the mic, give it to the pastor. I've taken more of my time. If this is for you and you're saying, this is all me. You're telling me, Pastor Sam, that God's going to make it happen when it's not supposed to happen? Yes, but you have to rise up and pick up your mat and start walking. Yes. It means paralysis comes to an end. When you let God take care of you, you want God to take care of your circumstances, to move your waters when God wants to touch your heart and change your life forevermore. At the count of three, if it's for you, come out of your seat and step into the fullness of this anointing and of your destiny. One, two, three, come right now. If you have to wait, then it's not for you. If you have to think about it, then it's not for you. But if, you, if this message is 179.3% for you, start walking, start walking. Paralysis comes to an end right here, right now. You will never be paralyzed again. Your dream will not be paralyzed again. Your destiny will not be paralyzed again. Your hope and your future, your love, your integrity, your righteousness will not be paralyzed again. Walk, walk by faith and not by sight. Walk. Because it happens when it's not supposed to happen. It happens when it's not supposed to happen. It happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. It happens when it's not supposed to happen. But it happened on the Sabbath. God's going to turn it around in your favor. Even when your circumstances say it's not supposed to happen happened when it wasn't supposed to happen. It happened. Look up here for a second as you walked out of your seat. I know it was loud and whatever. It's just, oh, I lived this. If you would have lived it the way I lived it, you would be as animate about it as I am. I lived this. I lived this. Do you... Do you know what the religious people asked this man? Who gave you the right to carry that man? You know what he responded? It is the greatest response you can ever get. The, read it, John chapter 5. He said, who gave me the right? The one who healed me gave me the right. So whenever they ask you, 
Who gives you the right to pray the way you pray, to praise the way you praise, to worship the way you worship, to preach the way you preach, to live the way you live, to give the way you give, to love the way you love, to have compassion the way you have compassion. Tell them, the one who saved me, the one who delivered me, the one who healed me, the one who filled me, gives me the right. The only one that has the right to tell you what you can and cannot carry is the one who saved, delivered, healed you, filled you. Jesus is the only one that has that right. So I come to the house, Modesto, preaching from the pulpit of one of my heroes with this honor and this God-given privilege to tell you to rise. To rise up, pick up your mat and start walking. Because you are about to occupy what you've never occupied before. You are about to see what you've never seen before. You are about to accomplish what you've never accomplished before. You are about to conquer what you've never conquered before. You are about to step into ground and land that you've never stepped into before. Raise your hands, let me pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person here who has responded tonight. Lord, and I release the fullness of this word, every single iota of your word. Today, I affirm via the conduit and the compelling power of your spirit, according to your word, that never again will anyone in this place or listening online will ever be paralyzed again. The days of being stuck come to an end right here right now the stuck season is over the paralysis season is over their minds their actions words deeds and thoughts their faith family future finances health marriages relationships harvest callings and mantles giftings will never be paralyzed again from this moment on they will walk by faith and not by sight they will pursue righteousness they will walk in the spirit and not in the flesh and they will carry what you have placed upon them and when they are asked who gives you the right they will say Jesus give gives me the right to carry what I carry and to do what I do. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm done. Where's the pastor? Where's pastor? Was he raptured? All right. Watch up. Ready? Ready? When I say one, all I want you to do is this. Like you stood up. When I say two, I want you to go like this. Pick up your mat. And when I say three, take a step start walking and when you finish it give God the best praise you've given him in 2017 ready ready tell your neighbor give me some room man tell him I have a big mat ready listo all right you ready one Two, pick up your mat. Get ready, Modesto. The best is yet to come. Three, start walking. Give God your best shout of prayer. Worship him. Come on, everybody in here. Let's praise him. Sing it one time. By your spirit. 